Good morning. Welcome to the July edition of Fireground Strategies and other stuff from the street um, on Fire Engineering Talk Radio. Um, I'm with Chief Anthony Avillo, retired. Jim Duffy, you know, uh, retired. So we're uh, still hanging out and trying to do our best to make a difference in the fire service. And thank you for joining us today. With us today or this evening, we have Mark Howe, who's employed by uh, Fire Engineering and um, Clarion Events. And Mark, I'd like to bring you on board. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good, good evening. I'm hey, sorry. Because this is being pre-recorded. This is, this is new for me. But the three of us all met on a project for fire engineering in 2008 uh, called Tactile Perspectives. It was a video series. It was uh, four separate videos. Uh, again, Tactile Perspectives, uh, Command, Fire Attack, Search, and Ventilation. And uh, we put this project together. And Mark, who's a video guy and a music guy, uh, never been a firefighter in his life. We had Mark in fire conditions that I know many firefighters are listening to us probably haven't <laughs> even been in. Um, we were definitely on the edge of 1403, kind of dancing around because it wasn't a training fire. It was um, a video. So um, we were definitely on the edge. Um, I don't know that I would do that again, but uh, it was a blast. It was a great mm -hmm. learning experience, and it was a. Those videos are still valid today. It's where Chief Avillo and I became really good friends, and how we got into this um, radio thing with fire engineering, and it's uh, it's been a fun, fun ride. And I know many of our listeners are thinking about retiring or are retired. There's so many things available to you to still be part of it. There's teaching, going to conferences, teaching local fire departments in your community, um, maybe even doing a, a podcast like this one. Um, Chief Villo, any words about Mark and our, our meeting and the homemade wine you bought us when we were all done with the project? Did I do that? Yes, you did. <laughs> Funny, we just bottled another batch the other day. So um, give me your address, Mark, and I'll send it up. But it's not going to be good till November. Uh, All right. It's okay. uh, it's called Road to Recovery, and it's a really nice San Gervais. Um, yeah, I, I remember. Well, well, I didn't know any of you guys. The only one I knew was Frank Ritchie, and Frank Ritchie um, pulled me in. At that point, he had a sling on. If you remember, I think he had fallen into a shaft or something, and uh, he, uh, he got injured. Um, and uh, we came up to Connecticut. It, it, I, I do remember it wasn't really super cold, um, but I, 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 think it was, I think it was March. I'm not 100% sure, but I got you know a chance to meet. Uh, it was the first time I met P.J. Norwood, first time I met uh, Chris Pepler, God rest his soul. First time I met there, my grandbrother Jim Duffy, and uh, who uh, who, uh, who else was in on that? Uh, that was it, right? Duffy. That that was the four key, the core four key players. But there, you know, we we had you know guest appearances from someone who did a spot on PIO. Somebody else did a, a quick spot. Yeah, you know, um, but most yeah. of that got edited down because you know they were starting to run pretty long mark will tell you he did a great job right well then he also did the May Day video and the dispatch video yes mm -hmm. yes yeah. so so yeah my experience with you guys all mark included i probably met mark the same day i met you and uh was the uh the tactical perspective dvds yeah. you know that was uh that was a lot of fun um and mark of course we uh well, like a brethren in rock and roll because, you know, I think we, we almost immediately started talking about music when I found out that he played. And uh, uh, those those were, were, were just great videos. Uh, it's funny they let us do it because – and we're doing this now because we have a face for radio. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this, this, this format reminds me of the Brady Bunch, you know, when you see the faces in the – 
you know, the Zoom always reminds me of the Brady Bunch when it, in the beginning of the show. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we did things that that nobody had ever done before with with live fire. And uh, yeah, Mark was uh, he was dragged into into the live fire, the first guy videotaping <laughs> in full turnout gear. Did did we teach you how to use SCBA? We did while we were there. Oh no! I I remember you guys are showing up and 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 thinking what's going on and and literally you said we're I mean I remember thinking this is crazy what are we doing you know and but it was so much fun and it was and it was the real deal and it was it caught my it actually mm-hmm. really gave me the fire bug I wish I would have found fire twenty years earlier but you know now. Since then, I've been able to. I moved out to Washington State, and I still work, obviously, here at Clarion, and happy to do it. But now I'm in an area where I can volunteer. So the second I moved out here, I became a volunteer on my fire department out here. So thanks to oh, you guys, shit. you gave me the fire right. Nice, and and you've it's it's wild because you have met and talked with like everyone. You know, at all, all of the all of the giants of this business, like you have had the opportunity to like to talk to these guys, work with these guys. I mean, what a ride, man, especially, you know, it, it, it's one thing if it's just a job, but it's another thing if like your your passion was ignited. And now you're like, you know, every time you, you're learning more and more and more, you can write your own book, Mark, <laughs> quite honestly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really good ride. And then, you know, the radio show and now, now this, you know, I, the zoom thing is, I, I think this is good in a lot of ways because on the radio, you know, we, we always were sort of, you have to be careful to, to not talk over each other where the other guy is like knocked off the radio. And, you know, this is such a more like, you know, free flowing type of thing, but, um, yeah, the thing in Connecticut, and uh, and then I'll, I'll I'll stop this little rant. Was uh, the most the coolest thing I remember was we just burned a building to the ground. You know, I mean, we burned it to the ground, and I was like, man, we can't do this in New Jersey. I mean, they'd never let us have fun over there. We know? can't do it in Connecticut either. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, how'd that get pulled up? Yeah. You know what's really interesting about that? We sacrificed a GoPro camera because we lit a room with real furniture. And there was a couch and armoire and a, and a carpeting and whatever a living room would be furnished with. And we put a GoPro camera in the room. It was transmitting out to Mark, I guess, and being mm-hmm. recorded. And we let the fire build until it flashed over. It literally Mm -hmm. incinerated the the camera, you know, but it it got video that you couldn't have gotten any other way. You couldn't have put a cameraman in there. You couldn't have, you know, so the GoPro was, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know what they cost back then. It was probably 300 bucks or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gave us video that you've not, is nowhere to be found. Although UL is starting to do some great stuff with that, you know, the firefighting sta- right. safety, they're starting to do some good stuff. Um, but at that time, it was just, it was great. It, mm. it was live. Um, we got local fire departments involved to get training. And Mark, you, again, you have, what you do for Clarion, I, I think is absolutely incredible. You know, you're now pumping up the authors. You now, I know you're always pestering me to write stuff, but I have ADD, not going to (laughs) work. You know, I can do an article, but I can't do a book. Um, But anyway, you get it all together. The training minutes, um, like uh, Chief Avillo said, the giants, the people who I try to, I won't say try to emulate because I'm me, but. Oh, I, you look are. At, I look at <laughs> I look at their careers and you know uh, hopefully I'm making as much of a difference with them and you mm-hmm. and your organization and David and Bobby when he was here and Diane have helped us all be able to make that difference and uh, mm-hmm. you know maybe I'm a little weird but that's very important to me and I know Phil sure. feels the same way 
Once I retired, to get our message across, right? <laughs> We're able to get our message across, and it's not only all the giants, but all the rising stars, like sort of, you know, come through. Like you know, they get they get their start a lot of times with you, and just channeled through you. You know, people that are are uh, are, are you know on the on the national scope now. You know, they they all had that like you know like me like Duff. We all had our start where we were just coming up and be like, hey, what are these guys? And all of a sudden people are listening to what you're saying and all that. And, you know, next thing you know, like people are asking you to speak places and, you know, and, and it's amazing because I've been kicked out of almost every place that I've ever been to. And, and I haven't been kicked out of here yet. <laughs> <laughs> Your time's coming. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. I think so. but, but you know what? Uh, we're still relevant. And, you know, I question myself about that every day. Um, again, a lot of my identity, not all of it, you know, I love my wife. I love, you know, hobbies that I have, hiking and kayaking and all that. But a lot of who I identified myself with was the fire service. And when I retired, it was a very, very sad moment for me, although a wonderful moment. Um but here I am almost five years later, and I know Chief Villa was longer. Um, I can still have an impact, and I'm still involved, and I get to hang out with firefighters all over the country, um, especially in Indianapolis. If you guys hear that, there's a pretty raging thunderstorm going on right now. But uh, it's it's been really cathartic for me. It's been – it's I still – feel I'm part of it. And I feel like I'm still making a difference. And uh, for me and in my core, that's who I am. I, I need to have that, you know. Um, and some of our listeners, they're, they're there for the paycheck. They're there for the egos and stuff. But there's nothing better than going to a job or a medical call and someone's alive because of something you did, or someone's life is better because of what you and your team did. So um, this fire engineering has been great for me. Um, you are a breath of fresh air. You're always smiling. You you know you always make me feel good yes. when I see you. I remember when we met up in Montgomery, New York, right where Chief Avila is now. He's a little bit south of Montgomery in Wallkill. We met for lunch up there um, after I went hiking up there. Mm -hmm. My wife and I, we met you there, um, right by where Presla lives. You know, we went to the yes. fire museum there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, but again, you had this giant smile on your face after spending the whole day doing a training minutes video with uh, some of the guys up there. So uh, uh -huh. thank you for being part of our lives and making us look important. No, thank you. I, it's been the greatest you know, honored to know you guys and get to know you. I mean, I, I remember when I first, when I first started, I asked Marla was my boss and I said, Hey, are all, you know, are all firefighters like this? And she's like, no. I'm like, what? You know, I mean, firefighters in general are amazing people, but you guys are the cream of the crop bar none. It's like, you. um, Stop. you know, no, it's, it's, it's been my honor to, to so, Thank you for being so great and, and making my job easy. So, well, I don't know about that. Man. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you made our job e our job easier. You allowed us to reach. You know, yeah. allow you gave us reach. You know, and and I had to look up cathartic, Duffy. I had to look that one. You know, providing psychological relief through the open expression of strong emotions causing catharsis, i.e. Crying. Crying is a cathartic release. Well, that's not the way I do it, though. I smile. It's my cathartic <laughs> one. I, I guess so. Tears of joy. Yes. yes. More, right? One other thing I oh, learned from God. you, PJ, um, Frank, and Pepler, we spent hours in the basement at Frank's house, all the raw video with the timestamps on it. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about what the um, voiceover was going to be and where we were going to cut the film. Okay, it, 
one hour, 22.333. We'll start it here and we'll do a fade into the net, you know, and I never knew anything about that and how much work it is to mm. edit. We didn't actually do the editing, you know, putting it together, but we watched hours and hours and hours of video to make it work. And then you physically made it work. And I don't think people who watch videos, TV, movies, realize how much work goes into it after the filming or mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. I, I am amazed at how much work you can get done from your magic board there. <laughs> No, well, you guys did the hard work because going through that stuff is that's a challenge, and and it was a joy because yeah. you you did you did all the hard work for me, so thank you. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that was ours. The villa was too far away to join us, but uh, yeah, I, I don't think I made any of those. Oh sessions. my god! And then the debate. I don't think the debates. No, we need to put this in. No, we need to get rid of that. You know, it was just it. That was put me in a burning building or in front of a burning building anytime rather than to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that had to be crazy, but you know what though? They, they came so good. Those videos are, came good. They're still relevant. They are, you know? And uh, yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're on what platform now? How do people get those? Oh, they're on fireengineeringvideos.com. So it's like a, a service right? we have that, has all all the videos and it's like a subscription service. So it's like Netflix kind of thing. Okay, so they don't buy the DVD anymore. Now they can go right on there and they could just Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Netflix to the fire service. Yeah. Fireflix. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Okay. Well yeah, I'll go because I, I don't I like being the man behind the behind the camera. So I, I should go and let you guys talk about real stuff. <laughs> Well, that is real this stuff. This is real stuff. Okay. <laughs> it's how we get our message out there, just like this. This is uh, a big change. This is the first one of these I've done. It wasn't just yeah. uh, audio. I know Chief Avila was a guest on uh, another show recently, so he's seen this uh -huh. before. Um, looking on my computer, this seems sharper than Zoom, the, the um, clarity mm. of, of our faces, which is scary, is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but anyway um, it's real good and we thank you yeah oh, to our listeners um this is the man one of the people behind the scenes there are so many people that make this work the people behind the scenes at fdic the volunteers at fdic the room monitors at fdic um the audio visual people at fdic all these people make us look like stars we're just a couple of dumb firemen maybe you know reasonably yeah. intelligent but uh you know you make us look good you know and um it's come a long way i remember when we used to have wired mics in the classroom i go this isn't gonna work because i'm wow. a pacer you drag the microphone or the wire around and now we all have lavalier mics and uh, yeah it's, I, I never I never wore the mic, man. I, I driving around, I'm pulling equipment off the freaking, yeah. off the, uh, the top of the podium. You know, stuff's falling. I'm like, nah, not gonna work. But you know, it's it's working great now. Um, again, the behind mm -hmm. the scenes people, um, especially Diane. You know, I, I can't thank her enough. But anyway, um, what I'd like to talk about tonight is. Um, I see a lot of people saying, um, you know, make this fire service fun again, make the fire service better. And um, this whole thing about, we have to start a new search culture. Isn't that our job? Has that always been our job? Uh, you, yeah. I know when you started, that was, that was so, that was what it was all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think, I don't know. I, I think there's a, like a, a thought process out there, and, and maybe it's not a thought process. I'm not thinking it might not be the right word that, uh, that, that some people are reticent to do the job. 
Um, so, you know, this, this, uh, this whole sort of, as you say, the search culture has come up and it, you know, listen, it's, it's all, it's all good stuff. These, these are motivated people doing motivated things, but I don't think we ever, uh, left our search culture. You know, I, I do think that there, uh, needs to be a, a, and it is a fine line between when, uh, when we can actually make a difference in a search and when we can't, uh, I think that comes with experience. I think that comes with, uh, with, a, a boatload of training and, uh, um, again, yeah, I, th I think it's something we've always done. You know, I, I know it's something we always did, you know, searches are, are, uh, you know, in, incredibly um, integral to the operations. As a matter of fact, what are your benchmarks? Your benchmarks are what? Fire under control. Your benchmarks are, are you know, a new one that's out there. Now, you know, it used to be primary search complete was a benchmark, right? Um, but, you know, the, one of the new ones out there, and I put this in the fourth edition because I heard somebody talking about it and I steal everything, is water on a fire. That's a benchmark now. That is a benchmark because once that occurs – Many other things can occur as well. You know, the building can be opened up, you know, and obviously not completely opened up, but opened up in a coordinated manner, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, years ago, those were the things you were, you, you were looking for, you know, uh, and, and, you know, actually I'm thinking about it. We would, we would, uh, the benchmarks, I'm remembering like the, uh, uh, like progress reports, you know, we have, we have two lines stretched. One is charged and operating on the fire floor. Another line is being stretched to the floor above. Primary search and ventilation are in progress. Like those are the benchmarks that we're looking to find, you know. Um, and uh, I, I think, listen, you know what? It, it hasn't really changed. I just think there's pe there are people that are making it exciting again, you know, to to a point where they're not cavalier, where they're not rogue, and where they're not spreading a message to people that are not that experienced that wow that's pretty cool it's pretty crazy. that are not that experienced that that sometimes take that message um in the wrong direction you know where they're they're operating um you know uh, in a survivable space that's maybe not survivable or rapidly becoming not survivable even to the firefighters you know and uh, you know, uh, experience teaches you, you know, get in there, you know, close the door, create barriers, you know, uh, get water on a fire. Those are the things that make make the search culture a lot more um, a lot more successful. Uh, but again, you know, listen, as Bobby Halton said, when when there's a lot to save, we don't risk a lot. We risk everything. But the real pro is the guy that knows when to risk everything and when to um say that or you know that this is not riskable it's not a risk you know the place is fully involved or, or it's about to be fully involved you know i i think things like the thermal imaging camera has has uh uh given us a a, a better barometer in identifying areas that are tenable and and untenable and and victims that are savable and and not savable i mean i'm not saying there's a line there you know there's not you know we go this way we go that way you know it's it's just based on a lot of different things and uh um, I, I think there's a lot of, of, of people that are excited out there and, uh, you know, uh, whenever I talk to them, those are the things that, you know, I listen to them speak and I say, look, just, just be careful of your message. Be careful that, uh, you are not, be careful about, of your audience because you have people that have experience and you have a lot of young people that are really excited about your message that don't have that experience. And it's your responsibility to make sure that they understand all those differences and nuances for, you know, searchable space and, and non-searchable space, you know, um, does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. But one of the thing I want to go back that you said very early in this little uh, conversation you just had, you said, I steal everything. You didn't steal it. It's called borrowed brilliance. <laughs> correct <laughs> quotations, borrowed brilliance. Borrowed brilliance. Okay. And I know that's cool. I got a whole book full of borrowed brilliance. <laughs> but, I, but I know you always, when necessary, you give credit where credit is due. You know, and I think that's mm. wonderful. We've all learned from, you know, none of us were born firefighters. And I love 
what you described about the search culture. But one of the things that bothers me, it never went away. It really no. never went away. I mean, there were a couple of people preaching, you know, you know, avoidance, and that's a good word, for avoidance. You know, if you train mm. and you're good at what you do, um, you lower your risks. Example, if you train and you train often on VES, you're going to get good at it. You're going to be more confident. Mm -hmm. You're going to be more efficient and you're going to be safer. I've been at conferences and people say, oh, we don't do VES. We're a small department. I go, well, I think it's a very valuable tool in a small department. Especially it's, for a small department. That's what I say. You know, big departments, yeah. they have so many people, it's easy. But I show up at a fire scene with 18 people. You know, that's what I went to work And that's with. a lot for a lot of departments. Yes. 18? I didn't have that in Weehawk, and we had 10. Yeah. Eight going to work. Exactly. So if you can take shortcuts or, as a football fan, an end run around the engine company and get in there and get it done. But – understand the basics get in close the door and do it if you hesitate you're given more of a chance for the products of combustion the fire and everything to come mm -hmm. to your location once you take that window so mm -hmm. again practice understand what you're doing the risks of what you're doing learn train 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 go to conferences don't become inbred don't just learn from your department and we've all been to places like that where mm. all the training comes from their training division. And none of their people in their training division go learn from other people. Um, I learned a lot from other people. We talked about that with the fly-in last month. Um, mm. There's so many things you can learn from other people that you never thought of. And I think um, training is what we need to to keep up. I see a lot of departments where I work is a prime example. They're so busy that their training time is getting shrunk down. Um, they're going from run to run to run, mostly EMS to doing fires, mm -hmm. but their training time is limited. Right. now. They're not in the, and you know, you may have a company tailboard drill, but you're not doing intercompany drills, training with the truck and the engine mm -hmm. together in, in a, uh, a training tower or building. So I, I think anybody who sits in that front right seat in any vehicle needs to be doing some sort of training every day. Now, if you're in a volunteer company, pick a night, make it Monday night, make it Sunday morning, but at least mm. once a week, you should offer some kind of training. Um, you know, hope is not a plan and we, Training Hope is not a plan, right? It's not. And I think if we train, and I said this a minute ago, we reduce the risk. Stop saying, well, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it because it's dangerous. If we train for it and plan for it and get skilled at it, it's safer. And that's my bottom line on training and, and the safety culture. There's nothing wrong with being safe. You know, I know... No. Right now, no. there's a funeral going on in Newark. You know, um, I was ju I was just uh, gonna gonna talk about well, that you, a little you bit. You do but that's your neighbor. Well, yeah. Let's let's still continue though with what you just talked about. You know, because you've talked about the search culture, then you went into the safety culture. There's also an extinguishment culture and a ventilation culture. You know, like all these things are intermeshed. You know. Like the search culture is not more important than the extinguishment culture. The, and none of them are more important than the safety culture. And then there's, you know, the, the, the art of taking care of your people culture. I mean, this whole business is, is about cultures that intermesh with each other. And, you know, and, and one is not more important than the other. I don't think, I think they all make up the big picture, you know, um, because you don't put the fire out, everybody dies, including us. So you have to have an extinguishment culture too. And your extinguishment culture supports your search culture. Right? As, does that make sense? As does ventilation. As does yeah. training. 
you know, and forcible entry and all the other things. You know, it's a it's a big picture. Search without all those other things becomes more dangerous, and also be- becomes probably. I don't want to use the word rogue because it's not the right word, but it becomes more dangerous. You know, yeah, you know, I get it. Sometimes you, you're going to you're going to search and you're going to search, you know, uh, areas that are you know, iffy and that's the way it goes. But that that's an experience thing as well. You know, at what point do we do we not search, you know? Um, but, yeah, just to talk a little bit about the the, the Newark uh line of duty deaths um i i I, i'm in new york now the uh um the funeral for uh for uh wayne brooks i think that was his first name was wayne Wayne. yeah wayne brooks is is this morning yesterday's funeral was uh augie akabu was yesterday and uh um i i went to the viewing on um for augie akabu on uh what's today friday so that was wednesday night so they did a viewing wednesday night Augie's funeral Thursday morning, Brooks's funeral uh, viewing Thursday night, and then Brooks's uh, fu- funeral today. Um, tough, tough, tough time for the Newark Fire Department and the fire service in general. You know, I, I, I took a look at, uh, you know, during the, the funeral, every Newark firehouse is being covered by another fire department from New Jersey. Um, you know, it's... And uh, when I was at the viewing, you know, the lines were just so, so long and it was 95 degrees and everybody in class A uniforms and, um, you know, uh, you, you, you see the, uh, um, the despair on, on the faces of the family and, uh, you know, this, this, you know, I hate to say that, that, you know, this is what we do. These are the risks that we take. You know, um, this was a, a super high risk, super low frequency incident, you know, ship fire. It was like a, a, a high rise fire and a confined space incident all at the same time, you know, on a, on a internationally floating ship with, you know, thousands of cars on it, you know, packed like this tight, you know, um, you know, and decisions that were made there were decisions that were made there. And, and, and you know, I'm not going to Monday morning quarterback this job at all. I knew the incident commander. I know a lot of guys from Newark. And, uh, you know, uh, you know the answers, the answers will come out, what went right, what went wrong, you know, and uh, what we can learn from it, you know, because that's really the, the most important thing. And, and I was talking to uh, a bunch of my buddies in Newark, Mike Nast, uh, Jimmy Weiss, and uh, – uh, Rich Gale and, you know, uh, Damian Emmerich and, you know, all these guys that I know from Newark. And, you know, sometimes just as Bobby, again, I go back to Bobby Halton. Bobby Halton used to say that sometimes the wild card pops out of the deck. And uh, it's, it, it, and, and you know, the it, it's hard to stop that from happening sometimes, you know. Um, and, uh, um you know, and, and, and also it comes back to the thing that, you know, sometimes you get the test before the lesson, you know, and uh, I, I think I think that there's a lot to learn about this particular incident, uh, although it, it's so rare. Um, I don't think the Newark Fire Department and, and really no department has has a lot, unless you're military or something, has a lot of training with shipboard firefighting, especially as international um, I mean, that was a high rise on the water. I'm sure everybody saw that boat, man. You know, that ship, that was, I mean, like, you know, and it was a steel deck. So think about the conditions that were in there. Um, no windows. Uh, the uh, From what I understand, and, and again, I'm, I'm not going to Monday morning quarterback anything. Um, the, uh, the standpipe connections were not compatible. They're international connections. And, you know, these are... These are things that, uh, you know, there were multiple agencies involved, you know, and, uh, you know, um, just uh, unfortunate that that this thing happened to these guys. Um, unfortunate for the Newark Fire Department, the whole fire service in general. And, uh, you know, uh, Duffy and I, we, you know, we offer our condolences, sincere condolences. You know, again, for me, it was in the backyard. You know, as soon as you heard it, you're like, wow, I wonder if I knew these guys, you know. Um or I came across them at some point, you know, but, uh, you know, Newark Fire Department's a, a, a pretty big department. They uh, have a long, long tradition of culture and, uh, you know, um, it'll, uh, you know, it'll, it'll take a lot, 
you know, to, to get through this. But one of the things that you always see there is the brotherhood, the, you know, fire departments from all over the country and, you know, all over the world really uh, coming in to uh, support, you know, and, and that's what we're all about. We're about support, you know, and we, we know this is a dangerous job. And when, uh, when the support is required, we, uh, we come in and, and, you know, the fire service as a whole takes care of that business, you know, and, um, you know, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll move forward and we'll learn. And that's, uh, that's, that's where it comes from, you know, and that, that's, that's the most important piece, you know, beautiful words there, chief, <clears throat> you know what, um, every single one of them, um, line of duty deaths, they hurt and, uh, they even hurt my wife when she hears about a firefighter being hurt or, or died in the line of duty. It hurts her, you know, mm. how much has emanated from me and us, the, the culture. And when I say the culture, I don't mean what we just talked about culture, but the whole fire service, <clears throat> she's mm. absorbed it and she hears <clears throat> about it and, and she sees me go out in the yard and sit on my Adiranga chair <clears throat> and think about it and read about it and, and feel, you know, and I'm not even talking about what went right, what went wrong, but. I feel it, you know, he's one of us. He's, yeah. or she is a brother or sister. And um, it still affects me. And again, I don't work. Um, I didn't know either one of these guys. Uh, Mike Ness is the only newer firefighter I know. Um, so, but still it's around the corner. Buffalo, which is, you know, the most recent one before that. Mm -hmm. It was awful, you know. Um, I know many, many people who work there. And um, if it happened on Whitby Island out in Washington, it'd be this, I would have the same feeling. And um, it's, it's very sad. Um, I want to skip back to what we talked about a little earlier, or you talked about a little earlier, the line, <clears throat> where you put the line in. And you can't, there's no metrics that say, you do or you don't, to search or not to search. That's not the question. If there's a chance, mm -hmm. we search. But I, I do have to go back to, I believe in my career, the bravest man I ever met was Chief McNamee in Worcester. That man was the bravest man I've ever met. I had um, an opportunity to talk to him in a couple of uh, classes. And not that he was teaching, but he was actually a student there. And... Um, the men were spitting at him. The men were cursing him. He knew, he knew to pull the plug. He, he says, I'm not throwing any more bodies on this. And I don't know whether he said that, but how hard is that decision? You're looking at your men, your people and tell them, nope, we're not going in there. I don't know whether I, I personally could have made that decision. And I wonder, would I have hurt or killed my own people on top of the ones we already lost? Mm. <clears throat> you know, the circumstances that led that, it was, you know, looking at it in hindsight, it was an obvious decision. But what if I'm at a, um, you know, a triple decker and um, there's a collapse and it's burning floor to ceiling, you know, what do I do? Do you know what I mean? I fortunately never had to make that decision, go or don't go. Um, my primary mode is go. That's who I am. So what we do? Absolutely. But there was a point he saw, he goes, this is futile. We're not going to succeed in this mission. And um, he made a, a very brave decision. And... Um, Totally respect that man. The other thing is you can't let emotions take over. Use facts. Mm -hmm. Look at what's going on. Don't say, well, he's a brother or, well, it's a three-year-old girl. Um, mm. You know, like that incident down in Gloucester City in New Jersey many years ago. Emotions made those decisions. Um, they pulled the bill people out because the building was going to collapse. 
And they said, well, there are three little girls in there. And emotions, the command team got together and said, well, we'll, we'll try one more time. Um, the results wasn't good. But the rescue attempts by the mutual aid departments was absolutely incredible. But again, you can't use emotions. You have to use facts. This is also true in the firehouse when you're dealing with a less than motivated firefighter. You know, you can't get your emotions involved. Like, what the f is wrong with this guy? I'm going to mm -hmm. you can't let emotions get involved. You have to look at the facts. Is he meeting the job performance? Is he doing his job? Um, you know, it, it's difficult. And I know you used the, uh, the phases of fire to describe employee relations. And I love that. The incipient, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. Address it. What's going on? What are the facts? Don't discipline people because they pissed you off. That's an emotional response. And the same holds true. Exactly. Fire. Exactly. Well, I think, you know, um, that's one of those things where, you know, we're, we're you know, we're kind of coming off the fire ground now and that's okay. Um, uh, you know, you ha we, that's one of the things we looked at in full contact leadership. And uh, uh, I do it in that class. It's, um, it's about the incipient phase of, I don't want to use the word discipline, the incipient phase of, of well, I guess it is discipline and not, and discipline is not a bad thing. Discipline gets a bad rap as that flood said. You know, discipline is, is what is the thread that holds the department together. It's the glue that holds everything together is discipline. But, you know, um, as an officer, one of the things you want to be able to do, and I'll go even further uh, earlier than incipient, I'll go into I'll go into fire prevention is you need to be able to forecast the storm clouds brewing. You know, you got to know your people. You have to know what makes them tick. You have to know when they're a little bit off and, and when they are, you know, you have to be close enough to them uh, as a, a, a mentor and a superior to be able to address that. And that's actually, you know, pre-ignition stage, you know. However, you know, there are times when that doesn't happen. And now, you know, uh, the incipient phase of, of taking care of problems. But because as the problem gets bigger, you know, it goes incipient and then it goes uh, growth and then it goes flash over and free burning and, and decay obviously being the worst because what, what's gone is not coming back, you know. Um, but the, the, the more involved you, you address an issue, the more, the more injury to the organization, the more time needs to be invested. Sometimes the more, um, and I hate to use the word feelings and emotions, you know, but uh, when you have to deal with that, you know, um, you know, you should certainly be emotionless and, but, but, you know, again, empathetic when necessary. Um, but, you know, those are the things that, that you look at, you know, what phase am I getting into? You know, and, and a lot of times if you're dealing with things in the, in the growth of the flashover or the fully developed phase, it's because you didn't pay attention in the incipient stage. You weren't, you aren't on your game as an officer. You know, you have to, you have to be always like taking the temperature of, of, of your crew, of a situation, and you have to look at, okay, what, what is, you know, what's acceptable, what's not. And, and again, these are expectations that are set beforehand. But if you're setting expectations and you're allowing those expectations to not be followed, um, then, uh, then you're going to wind up um, having to deal with it when it's in a much higher, you know, uh, uh, state of burning, so to speak. You know, and and again, the, the, the more the more involved it is, you know, uh, the more tools you need to fix it. You know, and, and I think uh, I think that's something that every officer has to look at. Am I am I looking to, at the forecast the storm clouds? Am I looking for storm clouds brewing? Am I looking for it? Uh, you know, can I recognize the incipient phase of a problem? that at some point can can burn my whole command down. You know, oh, I like that. Burn down your whole command. That's, right yeah, down. yeah, and I don't have a pen in front of me. Um, that will wind up in a class somewhere. But yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, and it always bleeds out onto the fire ground. You know, it always does. It always finds its way there somehow. You know, so you have to be, you know, vigilant in, in your, your, 
um, your recognition of when something smells like it's burning, right? I really like the um, prevention part of it. That's that's something I never thought of, the prevention part of it. Yeah. But I always viewed that as the recipient part. You know the employees. You know what the problem is. And in all of what you just said, if I look at any of my failings over my career, it's because I let my emotions, and I can't blame anybody else, I failed mm-hmm. miserably because I let my emotions take over. I lost my temper unnecessarily. Um, my You? Come on. The belief in my heart is there's no yelling on a fire ground unless somebody's about to no yelling at all unless somebody's about to die. Um, but I have failed at the, that. And, you know, my people will tell you that, um, you know, I have buttons and some of them look for them. And but um, they were failings. I may have won the battle at the moment, but it hurt my credibility in the, sh- the medium term and the long term uh, because I lost my temper and could have been handled at a much more mental way of handling it, you know? Mm. And, um, you know, over my career, I can look at them and they, I mean, it worked out fine always, but it was not professional. It was not um, being clear. It was being emotional. Um, At a fire ground that, I don't think that ever happened to me at a fire ground. Um, you know, even accidents and burst hose lines, I, I don't get excited. We'll adapt and overcome, you know. Yeah. But um, in-house, um, I have failed, and I think many of us have. Um, not all of us. Some people that I've worked with are absolutely incredible, always like this. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I wonder how they can do it sometimes, you know, when the firefighter gets in their face and, you know, it's like, okay, you know, we'll talk, yeah. we'll talk at the end of the shift, you know, um, where I'm not built that way. <laughs> um, exactly. But anyway, um, you know, I think in, in general, and I'm going to go back, I won't say where we begin this conversation, training. We don't train our officers well enough to handle personnel issues. And some of them, they're they're good personnel issues. You have a good firefighter who's probably uh, maybe your best firefighter who just has poor people skills. And those people Mm -hmm. get promoted sometimes and they never learn the people skills. They never learned how to sell. And, um, somebody with emotional problems at home, somebody who has problems with another firefighter. And I know that doesn't happen in your department, but it happens in some (laughs) departments. You know, people don't, how do you fix that? We're not taught that. Okay, tomorrow you're going to be a lieutenant, tomorrow you're going to be a captain, you know, and now you have your engineer and the guy on the back step. They don't like each other. They don't talk to each other. Mm-hmm. You know, or you know, who knows? Maybe they, one of them dated his wife or something. You know, who knows what caused it? Um, maybe the person on the back step really wanted to be the engineer. You know, and there's some animosity there, and we're not taught how to fix that. If we don't read on our own, um, mm-hmm. learn on our own, take classes. There's a great book called Full Contact Leadership. We should be we should be required to read, and I and I don't mean that your book is one of of, uh, like of said, many of many, many many that helped me. Many of them are corporate America books, you know that I've learned stuff from uh, military books, but we're not taught. You know some of the old fire service do what I tell you, and and that's the end of it. It's still yeah, because I said so. Leadership, yeah, it's still rampant in the fire service. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not going to discuss why I made this decision in the middle of a firefight. But later on, I'll tell you why this was the decision we made. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, I I think um, 
you know, you talk about some of these things, and, and I think as an officer, um, there, there's – you have to know your people well enough, and you have to take care of them well enough that they trust you, which, are, which sort of then um, causes them to let you in, you know? Like, like if you know your people, and this is where we talk about forecasting the storm clouds brewing and, and you know, uh, even before the incipient phase of conflict, you know, um, when, when, when somebody has an issue and, and you know when your people are off, if you know your people, if you give a shit enough and you know your people, you know when they're a little bit off, you know, and, uh, and it's okay to say, hey, man, let, you know, is everything okay with you? You know, is, is, and that's another thing. Everybody has to make sure everybody's okay. You know, up and down the chain, everybody's okay. You can make sure your subordinate's okay, make sure your superior's okay. But the, the issue with an, with an officer is, is you know, the, the, um, your ability to sort of get in um, and help address some of the issues, not only on your own company, but but sometimes you got guys come to you, you know, with, with other issues that may be outside the firehouse. That that's a matter of trust. If they don't trust you, then no matter what's going on in your company, whether it's a conflict between two guys or a conflict on the outside with one guy, they're not going to let you in, and and they're not going to, you know, you're not going to be able to what we'll call force entry, because forcible entry takes many many forms. Try before you pry and just open the door is one way of forcing entry. Kicking the other, kicking the door in is the other extreme. Well, which one do you want to use? You know, it depends on how much they trust you, you know, and, and instead of, in, you know, interrogate and, and you know, forceful um, direction, it's, you know, inquire and resolve. You know, if, you, if you're good at inquiring and resolving, you never have to interrogate. And you never have to do anything that that's forcing them to do something because you're going to be able, you know, you have their trust, they have your trust, and you're going to be able to understand those things. And I, I think that's an important sort of, you know, where cohesiveness comes in, uh, company officer, subordinate, uh, and, and again, chief officer, company officer, just superior subordinate sort of uh, um, ability to uh, – to, to rectify problems. And, and again, this is where you forecast the storm clouds brewing. Hey, okay. You know, if you know your people, you know, when they're not okay, you can almost sense that. And they could do the same with you if you're that close, you know, now some guys don't want to get that close, you know, I, you know, especially if they've dealt with something that, uh, um, you know, was really unpleasant on a job, you know, like they were really close to somebody and something bad happened. Now they do what they back off, but, you know, their, their job as an officer is, you know, you can't back off. You know, it doesn't matter who your people are. An officer is an officer is an officer, you know. But but, but I think a lot of it has to do with trust, which is built up over time. And uh, and, and trust and, be, and being able to recognize when something smells like it's burning, you know. I'm going to use that a lot. I like that. It smells like it's burning, you know. I like that a lot, but you made me think of something else. We talked about firefighters not getting along. Sometimes there's issues between shifts and there's a firefighter from, I'll say, another shift or another group, whatever you call mm -hmm. a platoon, wh wherever you work, um, who's not, when he's in on a swap or on overtime, he's just not doing his thing. So when you counsel this person and try to get the incipient part or the um, pre-plans down, you talk to this person and then his boss comes to you and tells you he didn't do anything wrong yet. Yeah, but there's no. conflict that's being created. Yes, he's doing his minimum, less he's doing, you know, but he didn't do anything wrong yet. You address it when he did something wrong. And I'm like, well, I'm trying to prevent that because then it's going to be between shift three and shift four and it's going yeah. to grow. Um, but if the shift commander of that shift doesn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. No matter how much you try to reach across the bridge and try to help him, sometimes that's real. Maybe an old, old school, I'm old school now, but an old, old school style leadership, well, he didn't do anything wrong. So, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with it. And I don't want you, you know, it's, well, when he's working on my shift, I'm going to address it. Um, but there's still a problem coming and he could be like, but nothing happened yet. 
and that's a problem. And these people mm. exist in many places, you know, laissez faire. Well, you know what? There's not a war yet. So I'm going to just sit back and he's my guy and I'm going to take care of him. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue that we've all faced. Now, the way I view it, it's my responsibility to try to get that other shift commander on board and work with me and help resolve that issue. But sometimes, well, I, I, go ahead. Go, go, go. go. No, I said, sometimes, sometimes they dig their feet in and you know what? It's not yeah. the way I'm going to handle it. Well, but that I, still leaves that little incipient fire there waiting for the yeah, right amount of yeah. heat, the right amount of oxygen mm -hmm. and the right amount of fuel. And it's going to go boom. And sometimes yeah. you oh. can't prevent that. And then you have to deal with everything you just said. Mm -hmm. It's going to take time. It's going to hurt the department. It's going to hurt the member. What did they say in Cool Hand Luke? Some men you just can't reach, right? I, I, I think, though, that's also a function of, of, uh, of uh, uh, parity, I guess, um, between shifts, which is also a function of solid policy, um, rules and regulations and things like that, that, you know, um, uh, you know, that, that have to be followed. And if, if you see something that's going on that, that, you know, is, is quite possibly a violation, you know, you have the, you know, you have the, uh, uh, the responsibility to, to address that. If the guy's working on your shift on a swap, you have that responsibility, you know, nobody's ever just passing through, you know, you ever hear that time I'm just passing through, you know, um, Nobody's ever just passing through, you know, like you, if you see something that is happening that is going to interfere with your ability to maintain your in-service and ready status, you, you have to say something. Um, here's something that happens, and this happens, and you might have experienced it. Did you ever work uh, a mutual swap as a, as a shift commander? Yes. Yeah. So we had an incident one time. I was, I was actually on overtime, I think, and uh, – they had, they had a, we had like a, it was like a small job, you know, and, and it was, it was, weren't sure if, you know, it was one of those things where I got on a scene and, and, you know, a lot of activity going on, but I'm not sure if there's a fire and, you know, like, like, you know, we're still in the investigation mode, but there's definitely something going on, you know, and I'm watching all these guys and, and, and half of them are not geared up properly, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. No gloves and coats open and waist traps and some guys without packs and guy without a helmet. Like, you know, me, my friggin' head exploded. And uh, I made everybody, I, 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 I made everybody who was involved in that write a report. And I had them give it to their deputy. And, uh, you know, and, and that particular deputy was a guy who I was a ladder company guy together with on the chief flood. And he questioned me about it. And I said, look, if this is what you do on your shift, there's nothing I could do about it. But you know what? It's real dangerous. And uh, it's not going to happen while I'm on your shift. And it certainly is not going to happen on my shift. But, you know, and he's like, well, no, you know, it had to be this, that. I go, he was just making excuses, you know. And, and, and I love the guy. Like, we go back way, way far, you know. But there was a lot of excuse making and everything else. And what he was doing was he was – justifying that you know a, a lack of supervision across the board you know and uh you know that that that's tough listen you, you're 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 whether you're on your shift or not you're still do, doing the business of the department you know and you're always going to be a supervisor 24 7 yes like i always ask in the class i say look how many of you guys here are officers and you know hands go up i go how many of you guys that just raise your hands get calls at home from you guys that who work for you Again, almost all the hands raise up. I say, yeah, you're not just an officer when you're in the firehouse. You're an officer 24-7. You know why? Because they perceive you as the officer. They perceive you as the boss, and they perceive you as somebody that is is approachable. And if, if you weren't approachable, you wouldn't be getting those calls. When those calls stop, you better start worrying because you've just lost control of your people. You know? So, Absolute you know, truth. Is, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I – this this leadership class that I do it's it's based loosely on the book not completely on the book but a lot of it and uh, 
I, I have one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about is writing a second book called The Prime Directive and basing it on the class. You know, so actually what I have to do is I have to get the class videotaped. Hear that, Mark? Uh, so so I could take it then and, 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 you know, sort of translate it into words, you know, and, and then possibly, you know, maybe do a book on that. I don't know. I'm, that's what, I'm, re, I'm retired now. It's one of the things I'm thinking about, thinking about all these things, you know. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I, I, I think as an officer, it doesn't matter where you are, what shift you're on, you know, how long you've been there. Where you, you still have the same responsibility as every other officer. Absolutely. Uh, but And so do you one of the problems is, though, if it, you just see it festering, nothing has happened mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. So, again, policy is being followed, um, procedures are being followed, but there's something about an individual. and Something stinks. Right. And he's yours for the day. Like you said, just passing through. And mm-hmm. so... What happens there, it's either policy and procedures and or top level management or leadership or something else at the top. It's not going to make that other shift commander. Um, yeah, and most of what I'm talking about is not these are questions that I've been asked. Most of them are not from my past, although there have been occasional ones. Yeah. Tough but, questions. But that's a reality because. Some things you can't fix because it's not no. within your wheelhouse. And then, no. and if you don't have the backup in the higher ups or a policy, people get upset about social media. Well, write a damn policy. You know, right. they're not yeah. wrong if you don't have a policy that says you don't post anything mm-hmm. about a fire on social media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, That's listen, all you can do. do, you know, so you can't. Yeah. You can talk to somebody and say, you know, this is really, you know, you're, you're a captain and, and, you know, and all I see is these pictures of you wearing a fire department t-shirt in a bar, you know, it's not against policy, but it's really, really stupid, (laughs) you know? Um, And then the respect of your citizens, your firefighters look at, oh, you know, uh, my captain, the guy who's leading me into burning buildings is, spends every t- all his time off in a gin mill someplace. Hmm. It's not against policy, but it's really not the best thing to do, you know? So there's all these outside things that come in. But I'm watching hmm. you. Are your legs going to sleep? Me? Yeah. My eye was sitting like cross-legged. Uh, like that's what I'm asking. And I'm Are you okay? Yeah, okay. I, I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. We're, we're in over an hour. Well, not necessarily. Yeah. We, we well, probably need a little plug. We'll, in we'll cut it short because you're going to a wedding in a little while. Um, but let's bring Mark back in. Mark, come back on the screen. Come on, Mark. Ta-da. I got nothing. Mark. Hey. There you go. How are you doing? Um, <laughs> we're doing good. Um, we're going to do a show. short show today. Um, we're having fun. This is what we do anyway. When we, we sit and yeah. talk, you know, we're after this is what we talk about over a hamburger or something. Uh, but it's or, better seeing your smiling face, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I like it. And you too, Mark. Uh, um, <laughs> again, Mark, thank you so much for what you're doing here, um, getting us with some uh, video along with the audio. And just for our, our listeners or viewers, um, this is going to be stripped, so there'll also be an audio version. So those of you who listen to our show while commuting, you'll be able to <clears throat> get this. So when you're driving, me, I listen to the, all the podcasts while I'm mowing my lawn because it takes me forever. Mm-hmm. Um, but that kind of stuff. So um, I think this is a step forward for us. I think it's a step forward for Clarion and Fire Engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nice to see the faces behind the voices. Um, and, uh, again, thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to get some guests, uh, to come. Some of them we had to cancel in previous versions for several reasons. Um, but we're going to try to get some guests for the next show and, uh, looking forward to it. And Chief of Villa. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fun, man. It'll be real fun. Yeah. You know, enjoy your time, uh, in upstate New York. And Mark, it's right where we met for lunch that day. He's only about five miles away. 
Wow. Um, that's fantastic. Beautiful where, part where of the country. That's fine. It, it absolutely is. Chief, I hope while you're there, maybe tomorrow you can get out um, and do some hiking. It's a, a really That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping it don't rain. You know, yeah. but uh, yeah, I'm going to get out. We got the dog with us and we're going to do something. You know, we the wedding's not till like 4.30. Awesome. So um, one of the other things I want to talk about are brothers up in Vermont, upstate New York, um, a lot of places in Connecticut. Um, the monsoons that came, it rained for two days. Uh, rivers washing out bridges and roads. Um, up where I go hiking all the time in the Adirondacks, major roads are closed. You can't get from town to town. Um, there's resorts that are been totally washed out by a brook that became a raging river. Um, but mm. our firefighters are still out there um, doing searches and making rescues for people who are trapped in their homes. Uh, so a little mm-hmm. prayer and a little thought for them. Um, we talk about fires, yeah. but uh, floods are yeah. sometimes oh. worse. Same thing with our brothers in Canada. Oh Unprecedented in numbers of, of wildfires in Canada. I, 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 I can't believe how many fires there are up, are up there. And, you know, um, that's one of the things I never did, but I have a ton of respect for wildland firefighters. That is that is a really tough job. And, you know, our uh, – our thoughts and prayers go out to you guys up in Connecticut and uh, stay safe up there. And and again, uh, our condolences to the the Newark Fire Department. Stay strong, brothers and sisters, and uh, you know we got you back. Mark, thank you again. We'll see you in, Thanks, in about Mark. a month or so. Um, uh, maybe we can sneak our opening um, music to a, or introduction to our show back in, or maybe I'll re-record another one. Okay, that we can have as a an, an mm-hmm. intro. You know, I kind of was at a loss. I didn't know when to start because the music didn't end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's got to be eight years old. That that little recording. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, so. to Fire Engineering, Clarion, Mark, and everybody else involved. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you to the firefighters. Stay safe, and if you have a choice when you're buying products and you don't always have a choice i'm viewing you on my computer that's made in taiwan try to buy american um you know this hat made in america uh it's one of my favorite hats got a little fire truck on it um if it's a two bucks more people are working they uh pay taxes i got my salary because of taxpayers in a volunteer fire department you get your fire trucks you get your firehouses because of donations. If they don't have any money, they're not donating to you. Um, so if you have a chance, please try to buy American. And until next time, stay safe. Avilo, any closing words? Nah, been been fun. Thank you to everybody at Clarion and Fire Engineering. Thanks, Mark, for uh, taking care of us all these years. Mark, I'm not done with you. you. Oh. Do you have any final words? Oh, my gosh. I mean, final words? <laughs> oh. No. They, they, thank you guys, because really it, it as you know, I, I feel honored to work for Clarion for the fire engineering brand. But really, it is it's you guys that make the brand the brand. Let's be honest. I mean, it is without the amazing contributions that you make, that all of the other wonderful writers and presenters, um, it makes the brand what it is, you know, and, and, and obviously David and, and, you know, and Bob, Bobby's rest his soul, but, um, you know, and Pete, I mean, all, all the people there, but it, oh it is, God. it's the amazing stuff that you Thanks do. David, Pete, Diane. Yeah. Diane. Oh. I mean, I could go on for days. Um, yeah, and, yeah but it's, sure. it's w- without you guys putting amazing content that helps keep people safe and keep people trained. I, I wouldn't have a job. So thank you very much. <laughs> Mm-hmm. When are you going to plug into that Marshall stack back there and play us a little rock and roll? Oh, right after we're done here. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we may have to have a show on that. Okay. That would be great. <laughs> well, thank you again. Everybody stay safe. Yeah, thanks, and, man. Um, be well. <laughs>